May it please the court, counsel. Good afternoon, your honors. My name is attorney T.J. Murray, and I'm representing the appellant, Dan Pasek, in this matter. I would like to reserve just two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Just briefly, your honors, I'd like to kind of state how this case worked itself out. The appellant, Mr. Pasek, and the appellee, Ms. Short, were in a relationship for roughly about three, three and a half years. It was an on again, off again relationship. One party would break up with one, the other party would want to get back together, they'd get back together for a while, something would happen, they'd break up, a little bit of time would go by, they'd get back together. It was like that throughout the course of the three, three and a half year period. Your honors, when a court is presented with a domestic violence protection order petition, the court's job is to protect individuals from the threat or the actual harm of domestic violence. In this case, there is simply not enough credible evidence, if any, presented to the court to show that a reasonable fear of domestic violence existed to the extent that a domestic violence civil protection order should have been issued. In granting a CPO, domestic violence CPO, the court must find that the petitioner is in danger of enduring domestic violence. It didn't happen in this case. Ms. Short made several claims of past instances where she claimed physical harm from Mr. Pasek. However, she had no corroborating evidence to that. She didn't produce any police reports. She didn't produce any pictures of any injuries sustained during those incidents. Is that required to support her testimony? It's certainly not required, your honor, but I think it goes towards the weight of the evidence in this case. And our claim is that the magistrate issued this domestic violence, and then the judge signed, I should say the judge, issued this domestic violence civil protection order against what the greater weight of that evidence showed in the full hearing on the matter. Ms. Short had one witness who testified on cross-examination that she had never witnessed Mr. Pasek being physically abusive towards Ms. Short, and she had never witnessed Mr. Pasek being verbally abusive towards Ms. Short. In the matter, and your honors, I understand, deference is to be given to the decision of the trial court, and that's perfectly understandable. However, the decision that was issued in this case, while being very brief, contained some inaccuracies. The magistrate found that Mr. Pasek's witnesses testified that in general he was a good guy, but that the relationship was unhealthy and toxic. That's just not true. None of the, one of the three witnesses that testified on behalf of Mr. Pasek testified, I think said the word toxic one time within her answer about the relationship. The other two never said the word unhealthy, they never said the word toxic. Mr. Pasek's witness, Jen George, claimed that the relationship was not the greatest. Mr. Pasek's witness, Dan Forsythe, testified that the relationship was up and down. Even Ms. Short did not testify to the fact that the relationship was toxic, nor did her witness testify to that fact. She testified, as I recall from the brief, that she was thrown down the hall and that she was choked at her neck. Is that, if believed, and of course the trial in fact makes that decision, is that sufficient on its own to support an order? It could potentially, Your Honor. However, when you're looking, when you're making the analysis as to whether to grant a domestic violence civil protection order, the key question is whether there is a reasonable fear of domestic violence present at the time that this case goes to hearing. And Ms. Short testified on several occasions 
during this hearing that all she wanted was to be left alone. That's all she wanted. I think she even testified at one point. I don't want anybody to get in trouble. I just want to be left alone. I think uh, one of the things that was testified to in the hearing that's important to remember too is that uh, immediately preceding or within a couple of days preceding Ms. Short's filing the petition for the CPO, uh, there was a Facebook post that she testified my client made uh, stating something about an abortion that she had had. And when looking at it in light of the circumstances, that would lead me to believe that this Facebook post is what put her kind of over the edge as far as going forward and filing a CPO. She didn't testify that she was intimidated by this Facebook post. I mean, she just stated that Mr. Pasek said that if she didn't call him back, I think it was, that he was going to post this on Facebook. Um, he made a Facebook post about his own personal feelings. He didn't mention the name of Miss Short. Uh, he just said that uh, along, something along the lines of, I can't believe I was foolish enough to go along with what this girl wanted me to do. Uh, it didn't reference Miss Short's name at all. She, looking at what Miss Short testified to in the full hearing on the CPO, I just can't find anything that would lead me to believe that she was sitting in that room in fear that if this order wasn't granted, that she was going to face some or endure domestic violence. Well, that would be for the prior fact. That's a conclusion. What's in the record to support it? don't have a video of the, of the uh, hearing. No, all we can go off is the transcript of the hearing, Your Honor. And when it came down to the end of Ms. Short's testimony, and the magistrate asked her what she wanted from this case, she said, I just want to be left alone. Is that inconsistent in your view with her wanting to have order, a court order, to enforce that she be left alone? To me, it almost feels like she's, she was in the wrong court, if you ask me, uh, Your Honor. I think what she was looking for was more along the lines of a police officer calling Mr. Pasek and giving him a harassment warning. Stop calling her, stop texting her, uh, or else you'll be arrested for harassment. Well, no. the order that she sought and obtained pretty much does that. That's true, Your Honor, but a domestic violence, I mean, I would argue that a domestic violence protection order is a pretty serious order that's going to stop a, a lot of types of behavior. The key is whether the behavior of Mr. Pasek rises to the level of Ms. Short being granted a domestic violence protection order. And that's where we go back to the testimony about the physical violence. That's correct. And, and she did testify to that. Uh, and clearly the trial, well, I shouldn't even say clearly because I think the order that was issued by the magistrate and signed off on by the judge was inconsistent in, in really explaining why the order was granted. I mean, um, it on one line it says that the petitioner and her witness uh, presented the most credible testimony. However, on the next line of the order it said that although respondent's witnesses testified that he was generally a nice guy, all parties and the witnesses testified to the fact that the party's relationship was toxic and unhealthy, which that's, that just is not true when you look at the transcript of the proceeding. To me, uh, I, I think the magistrate might have heard the word toxic, excuse me, Your Honor, um, heard the word toxic come from one of the witness's statements and, and kind of just went with that as this is what all the parties and witnesses testified to, which is it's just, that's just not true. But there was additional testimony to excessive calling and stalking. Mm -hmm. So in combination, all of these different types of uh, behaviors are the things that 
she found to be oppressive from the way I read it. I mean, the finds of fact. Yeah, and, and Your Honor, that's true. Your Honor. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I think it's... Well, you asked for two, two minutes. Two minutes, Your Honor, yeah. Uh, I think it's important to, to think about what the definition of stalking is. And this court has found that what stalking means is a person engaging in a pattern of conduct that knowingly causes another to believe that the offender will cause physical harm or medical stress to the other. This court has also held that there must be a fear of domestic violence that's reasonable. And how do we judge reasonable? Well, in order to judge reasonableness, we have to look at the context of the party's relationship. And when you look at the context of the relationship, and, and all of the testimony in this full hearing would have shown that the party's relationship was up and down, back and forth. They'd break up, they'd get back together, they'd break up, get back together. The context of the relationship shows that this excessive calling and texting doesn't necessarily mean that it's stalking. This is just how the parties operated in getting back together, and they had gotten it back together several times by means of excessive calling and texting with each other. I mean, that was, it wouldn't have led a reasonable person in that situation to be in fear of domestic violence based on the excessive calling and texting. What was in the record um, regarding um, the consumption of alcohol by your client uh, that, if any, that would support the condition that you complained of? Your Honor, there was nothing in the record that would have supported that. Was um, he not asked on the record, or did she not testify about uh, excessive drinking? Neither happened. Um, it was a non-issue uh, at hearing. Uh, this, under 3113, the trial court it may add equitable and fair restrictions to a CPO. And uh, many appellate courts in this district, this court hasn't addressed it specifically um, but many appellate courts in Ohio have come up with a test to determine whether uh, a restriction is fair and equitable. And that test that they use is that a restriction must bear a sufficient nexus to the conduct that the trial court is attempting to prevent. This court used it a little bit uh, in a case called Gaydash v. Gaydash. Uh, they used a similar approach in determining whether a firearms restriction was, uh, was necessary. They didn't specifically state sufficient nexus test, um, but the 12th district, 4th district, 11th district, 3rd district, and 5th district have all used this sufficient nexus test in determining a fair and equitable restriction under a CPO. And in this case, there was, there was clearly no sufficient nexus. The, the, the alcohol issue was never brought up by the petitioner, nor was it brought up by the respondent in full hearing. No. So, it's it's my it's it's my opinion that that uh, restriction, even if this court upholds the granting of the civil protection order, uh, the provision prohibiting my client from consuming alcohol should certainly be over. There was something in the brief about um, uh, the opposing party's argument that there was no evidence that the There was nothing about his state. There was, I, I read that specific instance you're talking about, and there was no testimony relating to his state at the time. As far as the testimony was concerned, she was at the bar, he came to the bar, and she testified that he made these, these statements when he arrived. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm attorney Bruce Hall, and I filed a notice of appearance last week. I'm the latecomer to the case. Um, I'm here on behalf of the FLE. First of all, I would agree with uh, Mr. Murray, uh, specifically regarding assignment of error number two. Uh, and I listened very carefully to the questions that were asked pertaining to that assignment. And I would agree with his characterization, and I, I agree that that is a valid assignment of error. So I'm going to direct all the rest of my attention to opposing assignment of error number one. A review of this transcript, I think, supports 
entirely the magistrate's ruling regarding the alleged first assignment of error. Uh, this gentleman's behavior, the appellant's behavior, uh, was shocking, vile, consistent, grievous, involving really terrible statements and terrible physical acts towards this young lady. And it endured or it went over a period of time. And the behavior was unfortunately uh, consistent. Um, some of the questions you've already asked, you know, was there an allegation of uh, throwing her down the hallway? I believe that was one of the questions asked. Yes, there was. Absolutely. The specific testimony, she was thrown down a hallway. Another instance of her testimony was that she was physically choked. Was that on a separate occasion or was that a part of the... I believe it was a separate occasion, Your Honor. Another, she, she testified that this gentleman uh, would uh, come to her house without her permission, unannounced. Uh, she testified that he would sleep outside her residence in a vehicle. He would, she testified that she would, uh, he would knock at her windows. Uh, she testified that he would phone her and just keep phoning her and phoning her and phoning her over a period of time. Uh, that he would text her repeatedly. And then the one incident that I think is almost the most shocking, it, it again was asked about today, about the Facebook posting. Um, maybe I'm old fashioned, but you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have Facebook. I think we were better off. But in any event, when you put something that terrible about a person on Facebook, I think that's an indication of your entire state of mind towards that person. You're humiliating that person. You're going out of your way to assault that person, at least verbally. Anyway, if you look at the totality of the behavior over, over a, in a period of time, it's clearly abusive. And as I said, the abuse is both physical, mental, emotional, and does it go to stalking? Yes, there was allegations and testimony about stalking, specifically her being at the bar or tavern, I think it was called a bar in the record, and he just shows up and sits down near her. I have a question. Yes. Uh, in all of the many incidents, uh, was the um, appellant inebriated, drunk, did, did that cause the incident? There, there was no testimony okay. so we uh, don't as know. to I was thinking as to the order not to use alcohol, whether that was relevant to, to the particular uh, uh, protective order that was that was issued. But you, you I think you see, see that. You yes, I, I already can see okay. that. I mean, right. I don't think there's anything in a record that supports that portion okay. of the court's order. Okay. And I've read the transcript, and I don't think there's, well, I said in a record in a transcript, no. I don't believe there was any testimony that alcohol was a contributing factor or a significant factor in any of these acts that my client testified as to. Now, the court already noted that the magistrate is the person who has the opportunity to look at the witnesses and is the determination of the relevant facts. And clearly there was a lot of testimony. Um, my client appeared pro se uh, she had one witness, and there were a number of the, the uh, appellant testified, and he had a bunch of witnesses. And after listening to all of that, the magistrate found what she found, and of course she was in the position to make the determination specifically as to credibility. Now, the issue that there was not corroborating evidence, um, you know, that kind of goes back to the whole idea that my client just wanted to be left alone. And I think that is the essence of what these orders are all about. Wanting to believe, be left alone. She didn't run to the court the first time something happened or the second time something happened.
happened or the third time something happened. She clearly was reluctant to be there and she does just want to be left alone. That's why she eventually sought this order. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, the key question here is, and the key issue in this case is, was there a fear of domestic violence when this issue went for hearing before the magistrate? And I just don't see anything in the transcript that would lead to try or fact to come to a reasonable decision that there was a reasonable fear of domestic violence at the time this went for hearing. Do you mean on the very day of right. hearing? Even when she filed the petition. Okay, because if, if I'm following you, that would suggest that the events to which she testified to of physical violence were somehow stale. And sometimes we see cases where the petitioner is, you know, testifying to something that happened five years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the impression that this case involved that kind of situation. Well, I think In there. In fact, you said the parameters of their relationship was three and a half years. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think it's. While it might not be five years, I mean, she was the petitioner in the full hearing was really. I mean, she named dates. I don't know really how, how exact those dates were, but the fact of the matter is she was testifying in instance that it happened well before the hearing. And it goes back to the context of their relationship. I mean, I'm not going to get into an argument on whether those are believable or not, but the relationship was back and forth. This, the behavior that was clear and, and was there, there was excessive phone calling, there was excessive texting. There's no doubt about that. But that behavior was normal within the scope of their relationship. That's how they would get back together after breaking up. And at that point, you're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. The case under advisement and send you a copy of our opinion when it is completed. And we will also post it on our webpage and you can look for it there. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor.